facilities that are considered key to Saddam Hussein's regime, uh, Iraqi intelligence facilities, and of course, Republican Guard installations. The idea is if any command and control is left in Baghdad by tomorrow, they'll be completely out of touch with their forces. We're hearing some amazing numbers in terms of the military equipment that was used in these attacks, 1,000 to 1,500 bombs. Uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles we're hearing in the ballpark of 320 used on this day alone. Baghdad pounded, but also key military sites around the country. And you can see the images here unfolding on live television earlier in the evening. Virtually every type There, there. Uh, well, I can, just off the top of my head, I can think of a few hundred. I think a few hundred, and, and defections, though, you don't know, but we, there's lots of reports of defections as well. A lot of people so. just leave and melt into the countryside. Yes, yes, you and uh, other uh, officials in this government, of course, said before this many times that flatly that Iraq did have uh, biological and chemical weapons. We also heard from several commanders that, that they were actually convinced that uh, Saddam in the last resort would use those weapons. In these 40 to 48 hours, have you learned anything in addition uh, about that capability, about where they might be, and about the readiness of Saddam and his commanders to use them? And nothing definitive. The, Mr. Secretary, uh, Mr. General Myers, Mr. Secretary, please just please. The, um, the, there have been a variety of views offered on that subject, and uh, a lot of them tend to cluster around the idea that the most serious period would be if the Iraqi regime did not flee and the forces got close to where they likely are in Baghdad or Tikrit, uh, and the closer they got, the greater the danger of that. Um, but uh, we, we don't, that's, that's been more a theory on the part of outsiders rather than a theory on the part of insiders through interrogation or communications. General Myers, General Myers, General Myers, can you elaborate on the, uh, on the, the mines that were found? Were, were the Iraqis engaged in an effort to lay those mines down? Was there resistance? Uh, can you tell us anything more about that? I don't know about the resistance part. I just know, uh, I think I said the number was, what, over 130, I believe, mines. Uh, some of those influence mines, meaning they're not just contact, they can detect passing ships and so forth. And there were three, three boats, and they had uniforms on the boats as well. <coughs> it's one of the things that General Franks has prepared for, was to be looking out for mines in the Gulf. You remember in the Desert Storm, uh, in the, there were mines in the Gulf, and it was a... Was this in Iraqi waters, or was it... It was right up there, the it was, I, yeah, I had it on the, the diagram, but it was right up there along uh, the... Uh, Rocky waters, basically. Myers, how is the deadlock with Turkey affecting the campaign? Over, over, over. How is the deadlock with Turkey affecting the campaign? Over actually being able to get the overflight rights that we we need. Well, we've said a couple of times from up here that the uh, that we have forces in the north now. Uh, General Franks intends to put more forces into the north. It'd be helpful if Turkey would uh, would go along and and. Uh, and make the arrangements that the parliament approved, and that is for, for overflight. So we're still hoping for that, but we're not counting on that. And we have other ways of inserting those forces. General Myers, it's clear that you are in the process. And we're in the process of utilizing the other ways. General Frank, excuse me, are you moving to protect the oil fields around Kirkuk? General Frank, I don't want to go into the table, but are you moving to protect the oil fields? You all have emphasized the importance of oil. We've said that the oil is the Iraqis' people's oil. It's a part of the wealth of their country. It would be a crime to destroy those fields. Uh, we've had lots of intelligence that suggested that explosives were being moved into those areas and that there was a risk that the Iraqi regime would do what they did to the Kuwaiti oil fields and that it was an environmental disaster. Um, we, as General Myers said, have control over uh, a non-trivial fraction of the oil wells in the south. And um, we're fortunate to say that because of the speed with which that was done, there looks to be only about 10 
uh, wells that, that we know of out of possibly a thousand in that area uh, that have uh, been damaged. <coughs> several are still on fire, several are pouring oil onto the ground. We would intend to, in fairly short order, have the people that know how to uh, repair those wells in there and uh, putting the fires out and fixing the ones that are still spilling on the ground. Mr. Secretary, could you please for a moment talk about the use of the predators in this campaign and, and whether or not you've been able to glean any valuable information from the use of the predator? Maybe General Myers could comment on that also. We're, we're using the predator and, and it's helpful. Tell me, any, it ha, has it been really invaluable in terms of gleaning information that you can use to, pr to promote the campaign? It's an intelligence gathering platform, and we use it along with dozens of other platforms, and they're all helpful. General Myers, General Myers, question. Uh, are, you, are you moving to secure the field from the north, sir, given these fears that they might set them on fire? That gets into some operational considerations that I, we just can't get into right now. General, General Myers, 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 on the air campaign, that began after the ground campaign, which is a reversal of the first Gulf War. That's correct. Uh, can you talk a little about the conditions that enabled that to happen and what the advantages were of doing it that way? For instance, did did the firing in the North fly zone and the set clear out the opposition needed to uh, pull in those ground forces? That was a judgment that General Franks made after consultations with the Secretary. Uh, there were, of course, certain objectives in the South that uh, were important. Uh, one of them we just talked about, the oil fields. Uh, if you remember, the fires in the oil fields started before the ground forces went. And so General Franks had to make a calculation on when he wanted to do what he wanted to do. And that's just one of the reasons. There are a couple of other reasons as well. Uh, there were some threats, as you know, being moved into southern Iraq, artillery, short-range short, short surface-to-surface -surface missiles, and felt this was the best way to do it. The fact pattern is different. It's, it's a decade plus later. Uh, the circumstance of the Iraqi forces are quite different. Uh, the capabilities of the United States of America are quite different. Uh, there, I think that look, expecting that you're going to find a, a cookie mold fit between two events that are so substantially different and so separated in time by such a long period of time and so many advances in technologies and a, a notably different purpose. Uh, the purpose then was to remove them from Kuwait. Uh, the, the purpose now is quite different. Way in the back. Over here, uh, it seems to me that we're moving relatively freely toward uh, Baghdad. You, uh, uh, General Myers talked about we're 100 miles inside. There's reports of surrenders. Uh, and then with the, the attack on Wednesday that we degraded Saddam's capability of, of uh, communicating with his commanders, yet we keep talking about this overwhelming force uh, that we're prepared to use. I'm wondering, are you concerned at all that we will be seen as a bully? The United States and the coalition forces have taken every conceivable step, diplomatic, economic, and ultimatum, and a careful, measured beginning. What we are currently doing uh, could not, by any stretch of the imagination, fit what you just said. It would be a, a uh, um, it would be to misunderstand everything that's taking place. General Myers, there had been some concern that the Iraqis might try to use controlled floods or even sabotage of its dams or reservoirs to impede an advance from the south. Is there any evidence of that? And what's being done to try and secure those dams and reservoirs? To my knowledge, uh, there is no evidence to date of that. Uh, we have taken uh, some actions to help uh, mitigate that. I'm not going to go into what they are, of course. And um, I think, as we've told you before, no, I'll just leave it there. We, we just aren't going to go into the operation. Sam, last question. Could you describe the command relationship um, U.S. Navy Special Forces have with the Kurdish and the uh, Iraqi opposition forces in the north? Is it positive control? Or are they embedded with them and advising them on what to do? And is the United States asking Turkey not to send troops in beyond that refugee buffer zone? And if so, why not? Why? You get it. The, the, <laughs> we, we, we have special forces and units um, connected to 
uh, Kurdish forces in the north in answer to your question. And you can be certain that we have uh, advised the Turkish government and the Turkish armed forces that it would be notably unhelpful if they uh, uh, went into the north in large numbers. Uh, isn't that complicating? Um, isn't that the issue that's complicating the overflight rights? It's that request the United States has made that's now making Turkey say, well, then you can't fly through our airspace? There apparently were a lot of issues involved, and that may very well be one of them, but uh, the, over, over a period of, what, three or four months now that these discussions have been going on, my impression is that the discussions are pretty much towards an end. And is the fourth ID out of this fight, at least from Turkey in the north? Um, that's up to Tom Franks, and, and uh, he'll make judgments about that in good time, and, and uh, I guess time will tell how many forces will actually be needed on the ground, but there are other ways to bring them in than Turkey. Thank you. Thank you. How long will this war last? Well, even if Secretary, even if Secretary Rumsfeld had been planning to stay in the room for to take some more questions, I doubt he would have answered that one. The Secretary, as you could hear, being very careful in the optimism that he and both General he and General Myers expressed. Uh, just to recap some of what the Secretary and the General said, uh, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said that the, that the Iraqi regime, the Saddam Hussein regime, was rapidly losing control of the government, that a growing portion of the country uh, was now under coalition control. He did say, however, that uh, as far as he could tell, that the, uh, the uh, Allies had not been persuasive enough in getting the kinds of surrenders at the level that they wanted to allow them to call off the, uh, the air campaign that has been begun in earnest tonight. He also acknowledged that most of the contacts uh, that they are having with uh, the elite Republican Guard units, which are the ones that are considered the most, uh, the most important fighting force for the Iraqis, is with, is with uh, units that are outside Baghdad. Now, that's not unexpected, uh, but that uh, is obviously significant. General uh, Tom McInerney has been describing that uh, there are two key uh, uh, Republican Guard uh, formations units outside Baghdad in places where there's probably going to be some serious fighting. General Myers noted the capture of Umm Qasr, uh, the boarding of a tugboat uh, off the, in the waters off there, the capture of, a, of an airfield in western Iraq. We've been given to believe that perhaps more than one has been taken. He said that the oil fields in the, in the south should be secured by later today and that there'd been so far only a small number of fires lit, which uh, they took to be good news. He characterized the resistance that Allied forces had, had encountered so far as sporadic. Now, turning to, uh, to our military contributors here at the, uh, in the studio with me, General McInerney, General Tom McInerney, what did you, what did you take away from this briefing? Uh, what was most notable to you about the progress they made and the progress they may not have made? Well, I think they're doing it in a very measured way, uh, a fast but a measured way, because there has not been a lot of contact. And I think they've shaped the campaign, Britt, to ensure that in the early stages that there would not be a lot of contact. It's obvious from one of those pictures that we could destroy this army very quickly. It is the key center of gravity that is in our way. But the, the way they... The center of gravity that is in our way. The center of gravity to this whole success. Because if the army falls, then we move in. So if you measure everything we're doing, the army is the center of gravity. And that's split out into the Republican Guards and the regular army. Right. Now, this campaign has been constructed by going west of the Euphrates, where there's no population. That's the desert area. That's the thinly desert area. Populated, thinly defended. That we watched all night right. and uh, for hours. And they went very fast. And, and it is the entry to Baghdad. Uh, but the point is, it minimizes collateral damage. It minimizes contact with the uh, Republican guards uh, or the regular army. So is this the, uh, w the phrase that, uh, that would this fall under the heading of what... Uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf used to call, quote, haul ass and bypass? That's correct. Yes, sir. So and what do you say, what, what, what I'm how saying do you interpret is, the news out of Basra, then, that they're in, they run into well, some resistance well, there? Well, here's what, they're giving them a little time to make the decision. Uh, so to try to, I think they've set this campaign up to minimize casualties with the Army, and they're negotiating to say, as we have said for months and months, that, look, you're either with us or we're going to destroy you. And they've given them a little bit of time, and they've showed that. I think that is a very significant fact, and an important thing that the world must understand. Now, General uh, General Burt Moore, the uh, 
air campaign that's on tonight, obviously we've seen some of the results of it from Baghdad, um, but uh, it was made clear in this briefing that the northern area is being hit as well. Area around, we, reports we're getting are, indicate that Mosul and Kirkuk have been hit. Um, what what uh, did you take away from this briefing that struck you most? First, the air campaign and the entire campaign is going according to a predetermined plan. I mean, I know we, we all had a little hiccup after Wednesday that maybe they were shifting gears, but Secretary Rumsfeld said we are on our original plan, which I thought was uh, considerably important. The second thing is we've seen Baghdad sitting here. We've seen a small part of Baghdad, but there is a lot of activity that's going up in Mosul, up in Kirkuk, uh, and down in Basra that is all part of this, which tells me that we might be seeing a lull in Baghdad on purpose, again, as Secretary Rumsfeld said, to allow the uh, leadership to capitulate. Right, now talk to me about the tone of this briefing. You both have been generals. You've both been in wars. Um, uh, there's, uh, this is an unusual situation in which you're trying to communicate to the enemy the inevitability of his defeat and the necessity, if you can, of his surrender. At the same time, you've got this uh, desire not to be too optimistic. Um, they sounded like things are going well. You heard, uh, well, basically on plan, you heard General Myers say. Sporadic resistance, you heard him say. Um, should we as news consumers and viewers of this buy the optimism? Well, I think there is reason to be optimistic, but I think there in any conflict there is also always reason to be cautious. Something could go terribly wrong. We could run into a serious problem somewhere. The Republican Guard, Hammurabi, Nebuchadnezzar could fight much more uh, harder than we think they might fight. So we just have to continue to do according to the plan, plan for the worst, and hope for the best. General McEnany. Britt, this is a brilliant campaign. Uh, it is going to go very fast. If Hammurabi or Nebuchadnezzar wants to fight, they'll die. They can't move because we'll attack them. If they stay fixed where they are, uh, we'll, we'll we need attack. to point out again where those two, uh, two yeah, they're uh, just due west. Are. They're west and slightly and south. Slightly about, south, about 50. Now, they, now which side of the, the, the Euphrates River, which is, goes down the spine of Iraq? Hammurabi on? is on the west side. So that's out in the area where the yes. Marines are, where the Marines and others are. Karbala advancing. Gap. Karbala Gap, right? And 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 that's a key point, and and it's we'll target that with the same thing you just saw there with those B twos. And may have. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they have. They may have. Yeah. They may have. But that may, that may imagine, be ongoing now. Can you imagine if you were in an Army division and got that kind of attack uh, of over s several hundred bombs? Those divisions will be gone if they want to fight. So the way they have set this campaign up is there is no way it can be protracted. Hey, now, from what you say, this always strikes me in these situations. Uh, we're waiting for the beginning, I should note, by the way, for the benefit of viewers who may be wanting to know, we're waiting the beginning of a briefing from the White House by White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer. The President, we believe, is on his way to Camp David, uh, or will be if he hasn't already left, and we will uh, uh, be able to see his departure at some point uh, in the near future. Uh, that will be on videotape for a number of reasons. Uh, can we actually defeat uh, and eliminate this, these Republican Guard units from the air only? Absolutely. If we want to by choice. And I would because it minimizes our and, ground And they capital. can't get into underground bunkers and hide out and come out later and fight or anything Not like that? Not at all. And, and because, first of all, they're trying to fight an area that they haven't made a Maginot line. So they're digging places. They're putting their, their tanks in place. Our infrared, our Predator, our Global Hawk, our Joint Stars, all these sensors are vacuum cleaners and pick up. Uh, all this information where they are, and then those laser-guided bombs, as well as the joint direct attack munition, we focus right on them. And they're in an area, and they have to lay out to defend that, uh, that is very easy for us to attack. And fortunately, it's out of the, the city areas, and they are in a very, very bad position, I assure you. Now, the lull that we have, apparent lull, uh, or perhaps it's just the period between, as General Moore was suggesting earlier, just the period between the waves of of, of bombings. Uh, it's now, what, 10.30 uh, in the evening in uh, Baghdad time. They got plenty of time left to, to continue operations tonight. As I recall, in fact, it was about 6 o'clock Eastern time uh, in, the, uh, in the first Gulf War campaign that first night uh, when the bombs began to fall. That would have been 2 o'clock in the morning Baghdad time. So I suspect that anybody that thinks they're going to get a good night's sleep in Iraq tonight better, uh, right. better think again. We've got till about 9 